Okay. We read this morning of a very simple verse, a um, couple of verses, about Jesus having a blind man brought to him. And the blind man was taken to him <clears throat> in the hope that Jesus might be able to restore his sight. And we might move on to the next slide. What's that saying? Okay. And I might just read that out to us. <clears throat> it's, it's a simple statement that says that the people who came and asked Jesus to bless this man, they came in faith. It says they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man, begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus said, do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And then Jesus went and sent him home. First of all, the thing that occurs, I think, to everybody when you read this story is, why didn't the first touch work? What happened? Did Jesus walk up to him and say, here, try this? Oh, it doesn't work. How's it, how's it look? And the man said, well, it's sort of all furry. Um, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. And it's obvious that the, sim the miracle didn't work. And what was that due to? Was it due to the fact that Jesus got it wrong? that Jesus tried and didn't get the miracle to work first? Well, obviously not. What he was doing was trying to teach something. Every miracle that Jesus ever performed was a parable. Every single one of them was telling you something about spiritual life. And so when that first touch didn't work, it wasn't a sign that the first touch wasn't good enough. It wasn't a sign that the second touch was needed because the first one failed. It was a sign that Jesus wanted to teach something. He wanted to say there was a reason for a second touch. The man couldn't tell the difference between men and trees. What do you use trees for? What do we use trees, if you look around you here, you'll see trees everywhere. On the roof, on this lectern, on the piano, on the seats you're sitting on, in the structure of this building, Everything around us is its construction at least is contributed to by trees. <clears throat> what else do you use trees for? You use trees in summertime for shade. Hard to believe that there'll be a time when you'll be too hot on a day like this. But there will be days when you'll be too hot and you seek the shade of a tree. I lived in the South Pacific for a couple of years and while I was there it was just hot all the time. You'd feel the sweat running down the small of your back. And back in the 1970s, we used to wear terry toweling shorts, if you can remember them. I'm sure they were there to soak up the sweat. But the fact is that next to me, we had a pine forest. And I loved that pine forest. I'd go and stand in the pine forest just to feel cool and to smell the pines. But they were there to serve me. Those trees were my blessing. And what do you do on a cold day or a cold night? You chop trees up and you burn them. And you sit there with your hands in front of them and you get warm. <clears throat> the essence of trees is that they serve us. Trees are there for the servitude of man. They serve us and we use them as we need. What should our relationship be with men? Men up there for us to use them in service. Men are there for us to serve. We should be serving men. We should be serving all of those in the name of Jesus Christ. And so you can't go through life not knowing the difference between men and trees. For any of you who might have been connected to a business <coughs> sometime in your life, you might remember back in the good old days of the 1960s and 70s, there was a department called the Personnel Department. And it was based on the word personal 
or person, a human. What did they turn it into in the 1980s? Human resources. You were just like a pile of coal or a pile of steel. You became a resource and you were there to be exploited. That's someone who can't tell the difference between men and trees. That's someone who sees human beings to be used. And so maybe this was part of the message that Jesus wanted him to be able to see that. <clears throat> and he was going to develop this. But why two touches? Why was it that Jesus touched him first, and maybe to teach this message about men and trees? Why did he need to be touched again? As we said, every one of Jesus' miracles was a parable. When Jesus healed a man who was sick, or a man who was blind, or even a person who was dead, the whole purpose of it was to teach a parable, was to actually teach a spiritual lesson. When Jesus touched a leper, the message was, all unhappiness and sickness and sadness and separation of God is brought about by us and our disobedience, our sin, right from Eden, right till now. And when you touch the man who is a leper, the natural process is that all of that will move onto you, that that sin is shared with us. But it didn't happen with Jesus. When he touched, his righteousness was able to cover that symbol of sin. There is nothing sim sinful about leprosy. But it was there to actually represent that state of man. And so Jesus covered it with his righteousness. When he cured a person who had some other disease or mental illness, it was there to state that the power of God can overcome everything. When Jesus raised people from the dead, the whole purpose of that was to preach that he was the resurrection and the life. The instant changing of someone into a dead person into life was a symbol of what was to happen in the future. <clears throat> None of these miracles were new. All of the things that had happened with the touch of Jesus happened before. The prophets had been able to raise people from the dead. Elijah and Elisha did that. The prophets had been able to feed a multitude with a small amount of bread. Elisha did that. The prophets were able to raise the dead. The prophets were able to restore the sight of the blind. Remember the Assyrian soldiers that Elisha confronted and he gave them their sight back. Every one of these miracles had been done by someone else except one. There was one miracle that hadn't been done by anybody else. And I've quoted there a verse out of John 9 when there was another case of a man being born blind who was cured. <clears throat> and it was said in that chapter that this man who had been born blind was cured by Jesus and they said, never in the history of the world has it ever been known that a man who was born blind was given sight. Have you ever wondered why that was the only miracle that was saved for Jesus to do? Why could the prophets do everything else, even raising from the dead? And Elisha <coughs> even raised people from the dead after he himself was dead. You might remember the story of the man being thrown into the grave and he touched the prophet's bones and he stood up and walked out. All of that was done except this one miracle. This one miracle was a man born blind. Why was that saved? Because we're all born blind. Every single one of us is born blind. We are all born without the light of God until we come and we access Jesus. Until we encounter Jesus in our life, not one of us see. And in fact, this was what Jesus preached when he healed the blind. He said, I am the light that's come into the world. Just those two quotes, the first one from John 9. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. When the disciples asked him about this man who was born blind, they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither of them sinned. Of course they had sinned, but that was not 
the cause for his blindness. Jesus said, but this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Every person that Jesus healed was a parable saying that Jesus is the light of the world and that every one of us is blind. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. If you don't have the light of Jesus in your life, you have no sight. And every one of us was born blind. Every single one of us. And it's not until we encounter Jesus and come to understand the love and grace of God that is in the person of Jesus Christ. It is not until that happens that we see the light. <coughs> Maybe that explains why that was the only miracle reserved for Jesus to do. Nobody else in the pages of the Bible was permitted to do that miracle. And the very first part of the Gospel of John says that the light was Jesus when it came into the world. And the darkness was not able to overcome it. So all of this was given as a parable to us, but why touch twice? All of that might have worked on the first touch, but why was the man touched twice? There's something I love about Jesus' messages, and sometimes they are left us with a little phrase that I really like, and it says, imposing meaning. It is up to you and I to impose meaning on what's recorded. We're not told. But you're going to get from me what I think is a possible meaning, or at least a meaning we can impose on the story. Jesus is the light that came into the world. Jesus is the light that comes into our life. It doesn't come at one touch. Certainly it didn't in my life. I don't know about yours. It didn't come at one touch. I was not blind at one instant and saw the next instant. Rarely it does. We all know the Apostle Paul was on his way up to Damascus. We know that he was breathing out threatening and slaughter and hatred against the Christians. You know that in his heart he had nothing but hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the very intent of his heart was destroy the church. And suddenly there was a light from heaven. And a voice said to him, Saul. And he said, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And in an instant he was changed. Here's a curious thing. You know what happened to him? He went blind. He saw the light and he went blind. And it took him three days before the scales fell off his eyes and he could see the light of Jesus Christ. That was an instantaneous touch. That was a first touch. Can you think of some others that might have been a first touch? I like to think of Moses. Moses spent 40 years in the court of Pharaoh. I don't know. He was aware of his Hebrew heritage. Don't know what he did. Then he fled and he went out to Midian, got married, had a couple of kids, spent 40 years chasing sheep. And then suddenly something curious happened. And he made a fateful decision that changed his life. He saw something to the side and he said, I'll turn aside and look. What would have happened if he had not turned aside? But he did. He turned aside and he went to look at this strange sight, a bush that was on fire but was not being consumed, and he was changed. I know he fought it for a while. He didn't want to get changed. He fought the light of Jesus in his life. But eventually he became changed and he went down to Egypt in the strength of God. There's two that got changed with one touch. There are multitudes who took many, many touches to see the light of Jesus. I think Peter is a classic example. Peter spent three years with the Lord Jesus Christ. Three years. Three years every day and night speaking to Jesus. Three years hanging on every word he spoke. Much more than you and I have got written in the Gospels. Much more. At the end of that time, Peter still didn't see the light. When the hard time came, he turned around and ran away. And he ratted on Jesus and denied him. 
Then on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out upon all the apostles, and the apostles suddenly became powerful in the Word of God. They stood up and preached the Gospel, and they were able to do miraculous things, heal the sick, speak in foreign languages. And wouldn't you think that would have been enough? And Peter still didn't get it. A word had to come to Peter on a roof saying, Peter, don't call things I have cleansed unclean. Go to the Gentiles. And he still hadn't learned. I don't know how many touches we're up to now. But you get to the point when finally someone has to take Peter aside just in the meeting like this. Just in the assembly of the believers, Paul took him aside and said, Peter, you've got it wrong, mate. You've been separating yourself from the Gentile believers. When the Jewish believers come up, you can't do that. And the final touch that we have recorded with Peter took him to seeing the fullness of the light of Christ. When you have a look at that, you might think to yourself, what I would have given for what Peter had. You look at the blessings Peter had. Peter had in his life three years with Jesus. The Holy Spirit poured out on him, giving him the power to heal the sick. He had all of these things. He had a vision from God speaking to him. And he still didn't see the full light until who? Just one of the members of the Assembly of Believers spoke to him. What would you have given for all those experiences? And yet the one that really sealed it for him was just one of the believers who took him aside. You are surrounded by believers. You are surrounded by those who love the Lord and you should be eternally thankful for those who can show you the light of Jesus Christ. I'm going to apparently change theme now, but I'm not. It's a secret. When Jesus was going to be crucified, Pilate said to the people, I'm reading from John 18 now, you don't need to do it, I'll just um, read it out. Pilate says, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And they said to Pilate, but we have no right to execute anybody. And then the Bible records for us this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he was going to die. They said to Pilate, we don't have the right to put a man to death. That's Roman law. That wasn't strictly true, I don't think, because they had brought a woman taken in adultery to Jesus. They said, we're going to stone her to death. And then Jesus, of course, told them all that they were convicted of their own sin, but they were going to stone her. What did they do with um, Stephen? They stoned him to death. They had the right, under their law, to stone people to death. What they did not have the right to do was to crucify someone. And why were the scribes and Pharisees so keen on crucifixion? I'm sure you can guess it. Because if you hung a man on a cross, he was cursed under the law. And this is the proof that Jesus was not Messiah. They had to prove to the world, to the Jewish believers, they had to prove to Jesus' followers that he was a fake. He wasn't the real Messiah. How could he be the real Messiah if he hung on a tree and the law cursed him? And that's why they were desperate to have Pilate condemn him to death. If he was condemned for blasphemy, that was a Jewish problem, stone him to death. But if he was condemned for treason, that was a Roman problem and he was to be crucified. So the people desperately tried to get him crucified. Pilate brought him out, and there he was. He'd been abused. He was covered in a purple raiment that meant mocking. He had the crown of thorns on his head. He was covered in blood and saliva from those that had spat on him. He was bloodied and bowed, bowed in submission to God, not to Pilate. And our Bible says, Pilate says, behold the man. Have you ever wondered how that was said? 
Was it like a pronouncement? Behold the man. I don't think so. I think it was Pilate saying, look at the man. You're telling me this is a threat to Rome? Look at him. His followers have all run away. He only ever had two or three hundred of them. And they've all run away. He's got nobody. Not even the closest people are with him. They've gone. They've deserted him. Look at the man. You're telling me this is a threat to Caesar? And Pilate determined to set him free. Then the Jews said, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he is even more afraid. The Jews thought that they would change Pilate's mind by saying, look, he says he's the son of God. What they didn't know was that Pilate's wife had had a dream the previous night. Matthew's Gospel tells us this. And she had said, be careful what you do to this man, because he's a righteous man. And suddenly, Pilate finds out that he could be one of the sons of the gods. And suddenly, Pilate's terrified. The Romans believed in portents for everything. Romans seem to spend all their time disemboweling goats and looking at their liver to try to find out what was going to happen in the future. They looked into the sky for crows flying to try to foresee the future. And here was the perfect portent. Here was his wife having a dream and then the scribes and Pharisees said, this man is the son of the gods. And Pilate was terrified. It said at this stage he went in and he wanted to release Jesus. And desperately the scribes and Pharisees changed their tack. It says from then on Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out to the judgment seat. What changed? Suddenly, in front of Pilate, the man Jesus split in two. Sort of like superimposed quantum states. He suddenly became two. He became the innocent Jesus Christ. He became the innocent man who was not worthy of death but he became an object as well. He became an object that was going to be big trouble for Pilate. Suddenly Pilate could see letters going backwards and forwards to Rome and the letters were saying, we hear that there was one Joshua by Joseph who proclaimed himself king in Judea and you did nothing about it. And suddenly Pilate could see big trouble. He could see that there was the innocent Jesus and suddenly there was this obstacle in his way. So what do you do with the obstacle? He cut it down. What do you do with a tree that's blocking your view? You cut it down, unless the council tells you not to. Pilate couldn't tell the difference between men and trees. He could not tell the difference between a man and a tree. An obstacle that is only there for your use and for nothing else. And so he made that fateful choice and said to the Jews, take him. Take him and destroy him. And it's a fairly simple story. And the story is for all of us to keep in mind that the touch of Jesus Christ comes in steps. Every one of us still growing, aren't we? Aren't every one of us progressing along that path? And every time we do, every time we do, maybe may a stumble, we might go backwards a bit, but there's a progression and the touches are coming one by one that take us towards his kingdom. And there's one other thing that Jesus said that I'd like to bring up now, which might be on a slide, which I... Not got to. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. 
When he touched the man for the second time, it said the man saw everything clearly. Now, what does that mean? Well, it meant that he could tell the difference between men and trees, I guess, and it meant that he had 20-20 vision, and I envy him. Because I certainly got, haven't got 20-20 vision, I'll tell you. But maybe it meant something more. The man came in faith and he was touched by Jesus twice. And the light came into his life and maybe, just maybe, those words meant that he now saw men as Jesus saw them. Maybe when he saw men clearly, it meant that now he could see the way Jesus sees. And I'm going to give you one example of that out of our recent life. Okay, that's the slide. That's the slide. But, I've done that. but I've done that already, so. Okay. What's that got to do with anything? Do you remember the Cronulla riots? The Cronulla riots. Is that right? The Cronulla riots. I think it was over 10 years ago. I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. What did you think when you looked at the television screen, maybe, and you saw that behaviour? You saw them beating up innocent people. These looked like a mob of drunk yobbos attacking innocent people, beating them up, purely on their race. What was your thoughts? Was your thoughts how disgusting they were? How horrible this whole situation is? What a condemnation of human nature that is. I'll take a guess at what Jesus thought. Jesus looked at them and saw them as sheep scattered on the hills without a shepherd. Jesus looked at them and said, I died for those people. Jesus in love wants every person to come to him, every single person. And as disgraceful as those people seem, they are loved by Jesus and Jesus wants to bring them into his grace and into his love. They do have to respond to the message. They have to come to the message which has been proclaimed. They have to respond to the touch of the light of Jesus. But maybe that's how the man saw them from this point onwards. Maybe when it says he now saw everyone clearly, that's what he saw. He saw men as Jesus saw them. So as we come now to this table of communion, the bread and the wine, which represents the sacrifice of Jesus. Remember, that sacrifice that Jesus gave was his final touch that brings every one of us to light, that brings every one of us the opportunity of sharing eternity with him in his kingdom. It's a blessing we don't deserve. Have you ever heard someone use the expression to die for? Have you ever heard someone say, I went to a restaurant the other night. The desserts were just to die for. Well, guess what? Jesus thinks you ought to die for. 